Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. It is a genetically transmitted condition. Nature, not nurture, causes attention deficit disorder. Too many folks want to brush off ADHD thinking it's bad parenting, a fad, or just a reckless, unruly child. You're born with the predisposition. No group of genes have ever been found. It's almost always inherited. It's not a single gene to a single disorder. This is rooted in biology. I have it, my children have it. All four of her sons have been diagnosed. Something is being passed on, but it's not any kind of condition. Do we know what causes ADHD? People used to think it, it was due to negative parenting. We Nobody would think that now. Financial stress on the parents translates into physiological stress in the children. News confirming a genetic link comes as a relief to these parents of kids with ADHD. The fact is, here's the actual reality. Nobody's ever found a gene for ADHD. <laughs> Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, supposedly one of the most heritable disorders in behavioral science. But why then are we seeing such an increase in cases? Are we simply looking at a gene that's managed to hang on and torment a small but increasing percentage of our population? Or could ADHD be a learnt trait that can be unlearnt with time? This video has been made by and made for the enthusiastic layman interested in shedding a little more light on a subject that could eventually affect all of our lives. I invite you to join me as we ask one of the most controversial questions surrounding ADHD. Is this a genetic or environmentally induced disorder? We'll be covering epigenetics, the latest research, parenting, and the potential to improve ADHD symptoms by changing the connections within our brain. There's lots to learn in this one, and I think you're going to enjoy it. My name's Lewis McSporran, and this video is for your eyes only. If you're parents of ADHD, there's a one in three risk that you will also have ADHD symptoms. ADHD is well known to run through multiple family generations. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, it's said to be one of the most heritable disorders in behavioral science. In boys, ADHD is linked to genetics 65% of the time, and in girls, it's as high as 90%. Scientists have also found genes in common between those with ADHD and addiction, depression, and alcoholism. If one identical twin has ADHD, it's said the other twin has a 50 to 60% chance of also having ADHD. The percentage 50 to 60% does sound high, but if ADHD is simply a genetic disorder, why is it not 100%? The truth is, there's not yet been a gene or group of genes that have been directly related to ADHD. So why then is it framed as a genetic disorder? Why is it clearly visible spanning across generations of family trees? That's a question you and I both will answer to. ADHD has a genetic concordance, meaning a likelihood of inheritance. Just because we see traits passed on in families does not necessarily mean that they are genetic. The family-run Italian restaurant down the street, despite what they tell you on their sign out front, does not have authentic Italian cuisine and pizza recipes coursing through their veins from birth. Their craft is instead passed on through generations by teaching. The gene hypothesis is attractive, but it doesn't consider the effect of culture and environment on our physiology or biology. To say that ADHD might be caused by a greater extent from the environment rather than the traditional narrative of being derived solely from the genes, is not to say that it cannot be seen in the biology. Biological markers can be seen. At any given time, we can theoretically analyze our biology and retrace our environmental map backwards towards the start point, the genes. These genes carry potentials, and it's based on environmental factors and our experiences through our lives, whether genes are either activated or left dormant. The scientific field that studies our biological story is called epigenetics. It's now well documented that our genes express themselves biologically or not based on the circumstances surrounding us and our subsequent behaviours in response. So what's being said here? Is ADHD something that can be learnt? Is it a gene that we all have that only some express through epigenetics? Let's take a closer look at the culture we live in. A racing society that's chasing technological advancements faster than many of its human inhabitants and the natural world can keep up with. Innovation, renovation, intoxication and indignation sculpt our modern lives. And although we live in relative historical peace, we're busier than ever. 
But the parent, an already complex responsibility, becomes even more difficult when the cost of living and monetary pressures are added into the mix. The stresses of the modern world make perfect parenting almost impossible. So if we're in agreement that modern life is making parenting harder, can a parent's actions affect ADHD? There's now a direct link shown between mothers that are obese, drink alcohol, use drugs or smoke during pregnancy and an increased risk for ADHD symptoms in the child. If a child is brought up in a subpar environment, it has a higher likelihood of having ADHD traits. As humans, our biology by design is susceptible to influence by our environment. Humans have one of the longest development periods of any animal on Earth. Due to having such complex systems, most of our maturation is required to occur out of the womb. We spend almost twice as long in childhood and adolescence as chimps, gibbons and macaques. It's thought that our relatively recent evolutionary advancements to our prefrontal cortex system adds to this development time. Our prefrontal cortex can take up until our mid-30s to fully mature. During this time, it is more malleable, also referred to as plastic, and especially plastic in the first few years of life, leaving it open to long periods of environmental influence. The right prefrontal cortex, located just behind your right eye, is involved in our executive functions and is said to be the area of the brain that sets humans apart in our cognitive abilities. It allows us to moderate social behavior, plan complex cognitive behavior, make decisions, and is also implicated in personality expression. It is here in the right side of our prefrontal cortex that ADHD symptoms are thought to manifest. Apes that have been deliberately lesioned in this area of the brain during studies lose the ability to read social cues and participate in mutual grooming. This, unfortunately, then leads them to being ostracized from the group. If humans are injured here in an accident, they exhibit distractibility, poor impulse regulation, and other symptoms associated with ADHD. For us looking into ADHD, there are worrying MRI brain scan images showing smaller than normal structures in the right side of the prefrontal cortex in the brains of ADHD patients. Further concerning, is a study showing that animals raised in isolation led to reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex but no other area of the brain. Childhood neglect can lead to physical underdevelopment of the very area of the brain associated with ADHD. Connect this information with studies showing a link between childhood neglect and depression, a condition that is said to affect adults and children with ADHD disproportionately, and we can start to build a different picture of this disorder in our minds. Humans are susceptible to their environment, and the stresses of modern life are making parenting harder, which can lead to neglect, which may lead to ADHD symptoms. ADHD is a psychological consequence of a life in a particular environment, in a particular culture. So why then do we not see every child that's raised in a stressful environment develop ADHD symptoms? And why do we see some children that are raised in seemingly stress-free environments develop ADHD? but I never bought into the idea that this is a genetic disease or that it's a disease at all. They didn't inherit anything in terms of a disease. They're just reacting to the environment. In fact, they say it's the most heritable mental illness there is. And I say it's neither an illness nor is it heritable. Renowned addiction expert, physician Dr. Gabor Mate has a unique view on this and his work and understanding of ADHD inspires the next part of this video. Matty believes that ADHD is not passed on genetically, but is a combination of the genes and the environment. His doctrine is that the genetic component of ADHD is sensitivity, and one's level of sensitivity determines the level of impact an environment can have on one's development. Although stigmatized as weak, sensitivity is, in fact, a favorable trait in any society. Sensitive individuals traditionally have taken the roles of healers, muses, doctors, artists, and thought leaders throughout human history. The word sensitive comes from the Latin sincere, or to feel, a trait of emotional and creative people open to new ideas. Sensitivity is a predetermined lens through which we see the world. When using an analog camera, we first choose the film sensitivity before taking any images. The shutter speed and the amount of light we allow through the lens can change on a whim. But for all the images taken on this film, we are stuck with the same unchanged film sensitivity. 
We all have a genetic film sensitivity and two people with different sensitivity levels can expose themselves to the same scene with radically different end results. So why then do we see a direct link between children with allergies and children with ADHD? An allergy is an overactivity of biological cells against a perceived threat, a hyperactivity of the immune system, a hypersensitivity. Children with ADHD contract more colds, upper respiratory infections, ear infections, asthma and eczema than those without ADHD. A child's set sensitivity is genetic and the likelihood of a child showing ADHD symptoms will be determined by their circumstances and environment during the first few years of development. Extra sensitive people are in the most need of empathy and need attention in proportion to their anxiety. Not all children that are sensitive have ADHD, but all children with ADHD are sensitive. Gabor Mate calls out one of the best-selling authors of the 60s, Dr. Benjamin Spock. Spock wrote various famous books on child rearing, encouraging parents to leave their baby crying and to ignore the basic instincts of the mother or father to pick up and give attention to their crying baby with the end goal of raising resilient youth. Where's that advice coming from? Like, who are the experts that thought it was a good idea to not pick up children when they're crying? Dr. Spock, I don't know if you remember the mm -hmm. name Benjamin Spock. <clears throat> His um, book was just the most influential parenting bible for decades through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and he talked about the tyranny of the baby he wants to be picked up he says the way you deal with that is you walk out and you shut the door and you don't go back in other words you isolate the infant when ignored the main communication channel a baby has crying is taken away and now not able to express himself a sensitive child may feel misunderstood and neglected there is a strong case for these feelings originating during the first few years of life as a sensitive baby, not feeling connected to their caregiver. So the very advice that we give to a lot of parents these days already damages the child. Now try telling a mother baboon or a mother cat or a mother bear to ignore the child's distress. In addition, criticism can be equally devastating to those with ADHD, sensitive people that are desperate to connect with others but are so often caught up in social misunderstandings. Adults with ADHD are often described as having a thin skin, short-tempered, or oversensitive by observers, acting impulsively and unable to control their hyperactivity. Perplexingly, however, other individuals with ADHD may suppress their sensitivity, exhibiting the opposite traits. They might quietly scan rooms for reactions of other people to gauge how others might be perceiving them, adjusting their behaviour drastically, trying to fit into their environment. The overwhelm of feelings can lead to emotional shutdown. They attempt to tune out of their insecurities. Avoiding fears and insecurities by suppressing emotion is one way to protect your self-image whilst avoiding short-term pain. In a similar fashion, tuning out is a highly effective strategy to avoiding a stressful situation. Dr. Gabor Mate puts forward that attention deficit is simply a sensitive mind coping with an overwhelming situation. He believes that distraction is as much of an internal biological affliction learned as a coping mechanism to deal with insecurities than attacks from an external source. When confronted with a stressful situation, we generally talk about using either fight or flight to deal with it. But when you're young and the source of stress is in fact your caregiver, neither of these options are available to you. If a sensitive baby is confronted with stress, he may cry, but if this communication method is ignored, there is a second option that may present itself. They might adopt a strategy of simply shifting their focus away from the perceived stress. They may feel that there's no option but to tune out and divert their attention as an effective short-term resolution, but all the while feeling misunderstood and now disconnected. Helplessness plus emotional stress equals tuning out. Matty's point is that perceived stress and its impact would be felt stronger in a sensitive child. Even an almost perfect environment could have an effect on an extra sensitive child and they would still show signs of ADHD. It is not always due to the bad environment and often more to do with their genetic sensitivity. In the same way, a child of a more robust temperament in the same environment might not develop ADHD symptoms. Importantly though, if this tuning out technique is so effective for temporarily avoiding stressful situations, why would one stop the behaviour and what are the implications for continuing it down the line? 
If presented with stressful situations in the form of tasks they perceive beyond their ability in future, such as an exam or reading, they have already been subconsciously training themselves for years to simply lose focus and avoid the stress in the short term. We see this in a study that used EEG machines to monitor the brain's electrical activity in a group of boys with ADHD and a control group of boys without ADHD in real time. When the boys in the control group without ADHD were given simple drawing and reading tasks, as expected, the brain waves sped up to meet the demand of the task. However, when the boys with ADHD were tested and given the same tasks, their brain waves slowed down, the opposite response. Both groups had similar resting brainwave readings, but as soon as the task was given to the boys with ADHD, they began to lose focus, tuning out. Like the Arctic hares that change their brown coat to a snow white during winter, tuning out can be an effective solution. But if the environment changes, the adaptive resolution can become a handicap down the line. The ease of avoiding pain by losing focus is further compounded by the stresses of a frantic modern world and the abundance of distractions to hand. Learning to deal with emotional setback and stressful situations in a positive way may never happen. Is it this tuning out skill that families are passing down to the generations? A heritable sensitivity coupled with a flawed coping mechanism and unmet needs. To inspire self-motivated, self-regulated and self-reliant individuals, we may need to accept that separation anxiety is a potential cause for the underdevelopment of the areas in the right prefrontal cortex that project the ADHD symptoms we've been looking at. In the same way that we acknowledge that pills don't build skills, we need to address the coping mechanisms that individuals with ADHD use in the short term to their overall detriment. We need to focus on skill building and encourage the love and connection gaps. People often grow out of ADHD in adulthood, but many do not. Children need help to find acceptance and understanding. To avoid attention deficit symptoms, it seems that through a child's eyes, they must feel appreciated for simply existing. Achievements or behavior should not be seen as a condition for love. In our busy modern world, filled with technological distractions and financial pressure and working parents, connection should be front of mind. For adults, learning to self-parent themselves is the only option. Letting go of our short-term coping mechanisms with an unconditional self-appreciation and not hanging our self-worth on our achievements. Dr. Gabor Mate, in the last words of his book, Scattered Minds, which I highly recommend reading, states the following. If we can actively love, there'll be no attention deficit and there'll be no disorder. Fortunately, while we have covered the increased risk for sensitive individuals to absorb their negative environment, they're equally highly susceptible to positive influence. The ability to mend relationships and thought patterns is available to them. The brain is home to trillions of synapses and one of my personal favorite fields of study is neuroplasticity. The brain's ability to change itself is a relatively new discovery, but the old saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks is definitely well out the window. Countless miraculous recovery and brain development stories are told every week in the news and in the scientific literature. A question we may ask, however, is if ADHD is caused by an underdevelopment in the right prefrontal cortex, can we increase its activity and strength over time? And can we improve our ADHD symptoms at any age? The short answer is yes. With training, focus abilities can be improved over time. And since we know that dopamine plays a vital role in the ADHD mind, starting to monitor our dopamine sources more carefully might be a good place to start. I go over this in my previous video. What we may consider a more poignant question right now, however, and the answer to which may present a due appreciation to those with ADHD can be found in my next video. Is the sensitive mind of the ADHD individual, in fact, a modern day superpower? If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to my Brilliant Brain channel. My name's Lewis McSporran, and I'll see you shortly in the next video all about ADHD superpowers.